the amazing Spider-Man. Oof. This game marks Beanog's third official entry into the Spider-Man franchise, and like its namesake, it's the film's official counterpart in video game form. It's hard to really classify this game as a movie tie-in game, because while it does take place within the film universe, it just basically uses thread points here and there from the film in its own unique plot. That being said, I still do consider it being a movie tie-in game because its release window coincided with the film's release, and let's be honest, these games only really come out to market the films for you to go see them, which I don't know if strategically that works out as well as they think it will, because why would you pay $15 for two hours of a movie versus $60 for endless amounts of entertainment with a, basically a game in movie form? I don't know. Anyway, let's move on to the review. <laughs> this game features none of the actors from the film reprising any of their roles, breaking tradition from the Raimi film games. No Andrew Garfield, no Emma Stone, not even Reese Siffins as Kurt Connors. Hell, I don't even think they allowed their likenesses to even be used in this game because good grief, these character models look nothing like their film counterparts. And we don't even get to see Peter in this game, which is a good thing because, uh... Well, I guess we'll get there in the next game. Instead, we get Sam Regal as Peter Parker in Spider-Man and Kari Walger in returning this time, but as Gwen Stacy. And Steve Bloom as Kurt Connors. The big baddie of the game is Alistair Smythe, which, in hindsight, had the amazing franchise actually panned out, would have been hilarious to see this game backpedal its way into retconning this game's events. Also, sorry BJ Novak, you really didn't get a chance. Anyway, Smythe is voiced by none other than Nolan North. Admittedly, North's performance in this game makes me laugh. He plays Smythe strictly like an intellectual scientist, but once his descent into madness begins, he basically loses that slight accent and goes straight into full-on angry Nolan mode. The rest of the cast is serviceable at best. Sam Regal plays a very forgettable Spider-Man, which is no fault of his own. The lines written for him are not exactly the greatest, and the main plot does the character no favors whatsoever, but at the very least, he tries. Dealing with my life, I should be studying, flirting with cheerleaders, and playing WoW. Bruh. The dialogue written specifically for him and Gwen is nauseating to say the least, and brings out the more cringe-inducing moments within the game. You know that you were the one! I first saw you in science class. I just wanted to be with you. As far as everything else goes, it's pretty underwhelming at times and feels off. It gets particularly bad when you're swinging around in the city and you have to constantly hear Peter whooping and hollering about it. At a certain point, you do really want to hit the mute button. The same could be said for the rest of the characters in the game, with there only being one moment in particular that actually got a chuckle out of me, which was Claudia Black's character, Whitney Chang, comparing these generic Oscorp goons to stormtroopers, which they really are. Hey, what the hell are you doing? Move! I'm not the droid you're looking for. The plot to go into more detail is, um, how do we say this? Dumb? Is dumb the right word? I feel like we're encountering a pattern with these Beanox games. While I do give them credit for coming up with an original plot and not essentially recreating the film in video game form, the plot in this game is all kinds of bonkers. It, like its film counterpart, revolves solely around Oscorp as the end-all be-all problem maker in New York City. Not anyone else, just Oscorp. Which I understand, given this is the film universe and they can't exactly pluck other names or villains that they don't have access to. But having all of these problems come from one place and not having that place be shut down is... strange? Even by New York standards. It takes place a while after the events of the film in which Gwen Stacy suspects that Oscorp is still conducting cross-species experiments after the lizard catastrophe that nearly engulfed New York. It's here where they encounter the rhino who charges at them before eating a force field and being made to look more stupid as usual. As we're introduced to Smythe who comes out in a panic running to see if everyone's okay. He then scolds Gwen for being there after hours and wonders why as Peter covers for her, saying that he just wanted to take a look around and was a big fan and it was his fault. Smythe obliges? Why exactly? You have highly dangerous, contagious cross species running around. One who nearly trampled someone had a force field not been up, and you all of a sudden want to give these people a full tour of things that are supposed to be outlawed, and again, are incredibly viral? You are instilling a ton of faith in someone you don't even know, and someone who's basically an intern to keep quiet about the things that they're seeing. With no NDA signings and anything of the sort, just why? This already makes no sense and is completely illogical and we haven't even taken control of the character yet. Anyway, the cross species sends Parker as the tour progresses and they go ballistic because he's technically a cross species himself and look, the game never really goes into any explanation as to why they go nuts 
and Beanox is pretty good at adding filler, so they go nuts. They're viral, and they infect Gwen, Smythe, and a bunch of the other nameless Oscorp scientists, who you now have to save from converting into horrible mutations and completely losing their humanity, as well as maintaining the cross-species virus from infecting the entire island of Manhattan, which ultimately fails as all the cross-species escape. As you leave Oscorp to develop a plan, suddenly, giant robot. The pacing in this game, holy sh**. Who thought it was a good idea to fight a gigantic robot 15 minutes into the main game? That thing is bigger than Long Island, and here you are taking on a giant robot that hasn't gotten the National Guard called in, or smite the rest it on the spot. I gotta stop. I'm gonna be here all day with this. It's here where you have to enlist the help of Kurt Connors to develop a cure by breaking him out of an asylum and making things 100 times worse as you let out all of the inmates in an I'll clean it up later situation. Good grief. If J. Jonah Jameson existed in this universe, he'd have a field day with this. This just in, folks. We have breaking news. It seems that Mass Menace has struck again. Reports are coming in that Spider-Man has now broken into the Beloit Psychiatric Hospital and has let loose the repulsive reptilian rascal Kurt Connors, a.k.a. The Lizard. This comes hours removed from several cross-species being spotted in downtown Manhattan. Remember, folks, I was the one who told you originally a few months back that these two were in cahoots. Now all of a sudden everybody's doing the dinosaur and Spider-Man is breaking the lizard out? Convenience? I think not. He's a menace to society and a threat to all humankind and should be apprehended and incarcerated immediately. What's it gonna take, New York? Spider-Man to start eating babies? Are we going to wait for Spider-Man to start eating babies? You decide. Jared, cut to commercial. What do you mean we don't have a sponsor? Um, thanks for the update, JJ. Oof. I guess the Asylum stuff is just more filler for the open world, so there's that. Peter and Connors work together to create an antidote, but it's not properly tested. But Peter presents it to Gwen and the others anyways as he trusts Connors, as Smite takes the antidote and administers it for himself, not believing it to be superior to his nanobot cocktail serum still in the works. The antidote ends up crippling Smythe and sends him off the deep end, with Smythe now being hell-bent on killing Spider-Man and Connors, to the point where he is literally destroying the city he is trying to save. And... yeah, more giant robots. Peter ends up passing out from his encounter with a giant robot snake. Why? And Connors deducts that the problem with his original antidote, realizing that Peter is the perfect cross-species and therefore vital to perfecting the antidote for everyone, and develops a new perfect serum that's ensured to work, as it does, as Spider-Man, now recovered, is able to give the antidote to the scientist and Gwen. Smythe, who at this point has been fired from Oscorp, finds out who Spider-Man is because Connors made the mistake of leaving the apartment they were held up in to go see his family, and someone reported it as him coming out of Parker's apartment. I don't know how, because the apartment Peter was staying at was Stan Lee's apartment who he was watching it for, which was established very early on in the game, so his bases should have been covered, but I guess Beanox wanted to find a way to make Smythe more of a threat, so the secret identity reveal I guess was the only way to do that, and not like threatening Gwen, who he's practically next to the entire time and knows the two are lovebirds, and yeah, I don't know, this guy is stupid, okay? Add to the fact that this being the reason why he deducts the secret identity thing, everyone in New York should come to the same conclusion as well, because Spider-Man broke Kurt Connors out of the asylum, making this one of the dumbest things Spider-Man has ever done, number one, and number two, one of the least thought-through threads in a Spider-Man story. Way to go. Smythe kidnaps Connors and sends out one of his spider hunters to literally crash through the apartment building and take Peter out and taunting him, telling him that he's got Connors and dares him to rescue him. It's obviously a trap, and Smythe captures Peter, who manages to free Connors out of Oscorp, and tells him to return to his old lab. He is then injected with a nanobot cocktail, eliminating his powers. I guess Beanox really likes this whole Powerless Peter Parker plot thread because they just love doing it. This is the second game in a row. Powerless Peter Parker now has to escape Oscorp and a vindictive Smythe before being killed, and he manages to do so, meeting up with Connors and Gwen in the sewers. Connors, realizing Peter being in no condition to help, decides the only way to stop Smythe and the virus is to once again become the Lizard, and by moving as fast as possible to defeat Smythe and administer the cure before the Lizard completely takes control of his mind. Peter here then momentarily dies due to the cocktail. Again? We did this in the last game. He is then seemingly brought back to life by Gwen via a defibrillator. Convenient. It's here where it's discovered that with enough electricity, the nanobots in Peter's bloodstream will seemingly cease to exist, re-enabling his powers. Wait a minute, wouldn't that mean that if anybody else who got cured by this nanobot cocktail had enough electricity put into their body, they would essentially become a cross-species again anyways? Yeah, real good job, Smythe. 
Oh God, this game's writing. Anyways, that's what he does, and he regains his powers working together with Connors to take down Smythe, who in every evil scientist trope realizes the error of his ways and the damage he has caused. Because the giant robot raining missiles down in Manhattan clearly wasn't enough. Oh man, this game's writing. Unfortunately, the lizard has taken control of Connors, and Peter now has to track him down and heal him too, which he does. And the city then gets cured, and Connors returns to the asylum. And despite the fact that Spider-Man did so many things that did not help with this pandemic whatsoever and could be labeled as a war criminal, to be honest, he's regarded as a hero. Oh, and Smythe kills himself in a really oddly dark post credit sequence. Yep, that's the plot. It's pretty poor, and the pacing is god-awful, and the fact that the game goes from dismantling giant robots to fighting guys that are slightly bigger than you, but somehow cause more trouble, is mind-boggling. It's almost like the game was developed with set pieces in mind and no real thought put into them as to how the execution of it all would work and scale with the rest of the game. Add that to the fact that Spider-Man vs. the Robots is hardly the most exciting thing in the world, considering that at this point in 2012, having heroes fighting generic robots had been done to death. It's about as generic as generic can be. And it doesn't help the game at all, despite some of the cool-looking animation work put into the game to make the sequences look amazing. Again, I give them props for doing something different, but the lack of logic and thinking in some of these plot threads boggles my mind sometimes. It's easy to be an armchair quarterback and complain about a story after the fact, and Lord knows that writing a story for a Marvel-based property off of a film cannot be easy. Especially when you have to have someone at Marvel or Sony sign off on what it is you want to do. But I just want things to make sense and have a thread of logic to them. And in here, there isn't much of either. You kind of have to turn your brain off and accept things for what they are and try not to get too mad when they don't make any sense. As a game, it's similar in structure to the other Beanox titles, but the biggest difference here is that this is Beanox's first open-world Spider-Man game, something many fans were clamoring a hopeful return for. While most enjoyed the more linear-styled level-based design Beanox entries, we all knew deep inside that Spider-Man excels in an open world, and it's where the character can meet his full potential in terms of maximizing the amount of fun you can get out of him. So this news was met with a widely positive reception, as that, coupled with the prolonged development time due to this being a movie tie-in, gave many fans like myself a hopeful glimpse into what could be a potentially good Spider-Man game. Again, despite two somewhat solid entries prior to this, the damage Spider-Man 3 had done to the reputation of these games, combined with just how cheap some of these games looked in comparison to the most games they were competing against, Spider-Man's reputation in the video game world had soured from must-play to probable rent to let's just not. Combine that with the fact that the Amazing franchise wasn't a whole hell of a lot popular with the majority of the fanbase preferring the Raimi films to continue over a half-baked reboot, this game had a lot going against it off the bat, and they knew it too, trying to cater to those fans by adding in probably one of the worst-looking Raimi suits in video game history, and shoehorning in Bruce Campbell as the extreme blimp dude who tasked you with race and stunt fests. His inclusion is probably the most egregious of the bunch, as the entire reason he was even in the Raimi trilogy was due to his personal friendship with Sam Raimi back from the Evil Dead days, who now had nothing to do with Spider-Man and was on the outs with Sony, so that's kind of a yikes. Regardless, they trotted on and they attempted to make a good Spider-Man game that hopefully would appease everyone. Did they succeed? Eh, kind of, not really. It's hard to say with this game. I'm sure a lot of people at the time really dug this game because it was somewhat of a return to form for Spider-Man, but that doesn't excuse a lot of the issues this game has. First and foremost, the camera without a doubt is one of the biggest annoyances in the entire game. It's so far up Spider-Man's ass that any of the newly introduced mechanics like the web rush mode that's a really awesome auto parkour mechanic that needed a little bit more time and polish, or even any delicate fast-paced platforming that's really only a lot in the open world, becomes such a confusing mess that you genuinely feel like you're breaking the game at times. The indoor stuff is mostly fine because the camera is far enough for you to see what's happening, and the environments are pretty wide enough, plus the game slows down considerably here too. But on the off chance something does get in your way, you have the ability to retreat to the nearest available high ground and reposition the camera there for your next move. In the open world, everything you do feels incredibly jank. Hell, it even looks jank. A lot of the map is repeated geography over and over again, which is extremely lazy in comparison to the likes of what Treyarch and even Shabba Games did with their respective New Yorks. Add on top of that that this game has Spider-Man magically swinging through the air, something that had been squashed out since Spider-Man 2 returns here, oddly enough. And even though the swinging is visually appealing with good feedback from the rumble feature on the controller and some excellent animations, it's an annoyance all the same because it takes you out of it when you're basically above a building and Spider-Man is still swinging somehow on a cloud. I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand. Oh, and the physics on web swinging are completely broken. Spider-Man's momentum is basically at 100 no matter which direction you point him in, and it's hilarious to see the game contort as you fail to commit to a direction. 
it's no surprise that the area Beanox has had the least amount of experience in is arguably the roughest part of the game, but even some of the things they've been partially good at suffer here. While the combat in both Shattered Dimensions and Edge of Time left things to be desired, Amazing had an opportunity to really improve upon both and carve out a unique experience. But what they ended up doing was creating a very simplified Arkham system, to the point where it's way too easy, especially past a certain point where a few upgrades essentially turn the game into a breeze. But even then, getting to a combo of 6, 8, or 10 and then immediately stunning a goon and pressing one button to take him out feels extraordinarily cheap, especially when every goon after that 6, 8, or 10 hit immediately and almost always is stunned from that point out. There's no real strategy outside of the occasional bad guy that might block a hit or two, or someone coming in for a hit which you have the absolute biggest window of opportunity to counter. And that's my problem with combat. Spider-Man's not much of a counter character. Any media you see where Spider-Man is in combat, he's mostly stylistically getting out of harm's way and then attacks with either melee or webs. But in this game, pressing one button basically does all the work for you. While you do have a dodge roll, it only really works for you to close in the gap on enemies and not much else. There isn't a lot of skill or creativity to this combat system and it really shows, especially in the The Lake game. I'm not sure if this was a choice made to appeal to kids or to have the game be more accessible, but despite its efforts, it really does cheapen the experience. Don't get me wrong, it's probably the best feeling combat Beanox has had out of all their games, and part of that satisfaction again comes strictly from the feedback you get from the DualShock when you're taking guys out thanks to the awesome rumble feature. But again, part of it is just way too easy. There's no real challenge. On top of that, polish is once again something that is coming to question. With a few years to work on this game, there's no reason why this guy should be A posing in the middle of his takedown. And there's no reason at all why this particular animation should have carried over into the Amazing Spider-Man 2 with no adjustments made to fix that, but let's not jump the shark yet. You add on top of that that webbing, say it with me now, is absolutely useless in this game. It has no real versatility in combat and is used strictly as a gimmick to deal with an occasionally shielded robot enemy or to incapacitate an enemy near a wall or in place. A massive mistake and a complete mishandling of the character. So many potentially fun things they could have done with webbing and they kept it to the absolute bare minimum for the third straight game in a row. <sighs> what a shame. On a more positive note, stealth is a little bit more fleshed out in this game, taking the template from Shattered Dimensions to War levels and tuning them up here. Though the new moves don't solve what are some pretty glaring issues with stealth. Again, the difficulty is what's coming into question. If you get caught by a guard, all you have to do is hit L1 and you're immediately bailed out as they all suffer goldfish memory and no longer know where you're located. They don't deploy any new strategies or means to counter you, but rather shift around looking for you with a flashlight at the most to which all you have to do is recognize the pattern and sneak around and attack them from behind. It's a little uninspired since if you're going to rip things off from Arkham and even taunt them in the beginning of your game, you should probably do it better or else it's going to look awful in comparison. And Stealth is probably one of the biggest offenders for that reason. You have 13 chapters in total, with the 13th just basically being free roam in New York, finishing any of the side missions you've left undone. The game is remarkably short because of this if you choose to bypass all the open world stuff, but on the flip side, there is quite a lot to do in the city of New York. While you do have your random crimes, you also have what I like to call busy work. Escort missions leading escaped asylum patients back to hospitals and six civilians to quarantine zones. You can deal with a couple of cross species that you let escape as well, which for the record, I'll give Beanox props here for introducing some of the lesser known Spider-Man rogues like Vermin, who you should all know from Craven's Last Hunt, and Iguana and... Piranha. Wait a minute, Piranha's not a Spider-Man villain? I'm pretty sure Piranha's tied to the Submariner. Yeah, Piranha's tied to Namor, what the hell is it doing here? And how? That's a legal can of worms. I guess that's why they call him Natty. Despite this, they still resort to using the same old tired villains like Scorpion and Rhino, so two steps forward, one step back, moving on. You have hidden spiders as well in different areas of Manhattan to unlock a few costumes, which in comparison to Edge of Time is extremely lacking. And the selection of suits is quite honestly disappointing, though I will say the awesome suit deterioration from Edge of Time returns, but this time it's tied to damage taken rather than story based. There's just something about a battle damage suit that's pretty awesome. Oh, quick disclaimer here, uh, for some weird reason, these hidden spiders don't really seem to work now. You have to change your console's eternal clock back to 2012, like December of 2012, in order to get these pictures taken for it to register to get your costume unlocks. I don't know why, but hey, there wouldn't be a Beanox title without something being broken. There's also collectibles to collect via comic book covers in which you unlock a comic book to actually read in the extra sections per every set you finish collecting, totaling out at 350. This is a pretty awesome inclusion, and I wish more comic book games would do this, to be honest. You also have secret Oscorp bases, which serve as means of upgrading your tech abilities. 
These are mostly tied to webbing and suit upgrades, and while some are handy, most aren't essential to beat the game. Hell, I beat the game on the hardest difficulty without having unlocked all of them, or even the combat upgrades. Combat upgrades are the most important, however, and those are tied to an XP bar, whereas the tech upgrades are tied to tech pieces gained by destroying tech things like robots or finding said tech pieces hidden throughout the levels. <sighs> Be prepared to grind, I guess. God. Again with this two-system unlock garbage. Streamline this and make it just tied to XP only, for goodness sake. There's no need to pad out the game time when you have a pretty big virtual Manhattan to explore and things to do in it. Or maybe not, because that's one of this game's biggest sins is not having anything to do once you've done them all. That's right, crimes and tasks aren't set to an RNG system like in past games, but are only set for a specific amount. Once you've done them all, you have nothing left to do in the city whatsoever. That's pretty awful, not gonna lie. The only thing left for those who do enjoy aspects of this game is to go back and play story missions again, but if you don't care for that kind of slog and just want to swing around the city and do the occasional crime, well, you can only do half of that, I'm afraid. This is a pretty big oversight that I cannot believe these guys overlooked. Half of the reason people still play Spider-Man 2 or even Spider-Man PS4, or any open-world Spider-Man game for that matter, is the ability to pick the game up and go from coast to coast swinging around and occasionally laying the smack down as Spider-Man, and this game only lets you do half of that making it totally unnecessary to even continue playing the game. Seriously, once you've done it all, you can sell your copy of the game and you wouldn't miss a single beat unless you like swinging around during different times of the day, which the game lets you select upon beating it. There's actually a lot more options here than in Spider-Man PS4, including some weather options, so uh, hey, there's that at least. There's DLC for the game as well, but most of this is extremely forgettable stuff. The one highlight, however, is being able to play as Stan Lee. You can free roam around the city and swing and do all the things Spider-Man can with additional crimes to dispatch of. As a matter of fact, you can do so many things Spider-Man can that the civilians still actually call you Spider-Man. <laughs> Guess that's an oversight. And then you have a script-collecting timed race in which you have to move as fast as you possibly can to collect 15 script pages in order to get a high score, which you can challenge others on a probable busted leaderboard that no one really checks and it's probably not working anymore, so... Content? Doing so unlocks... Everything okay? Happy Birthday, Spider-Man! My eyes! Oh God! What did I just see? I paid money for that! I collected 15 script pages as Stan Lee for that! This is for Spider-Man's 50th birthday! I think I threw up a cup a little bit. I think I'm done. I think I'm officially done. I'm gonna need to go power drill my eyes out and wash them out with bleach. So let's just finish out with this review. Amazing Spider-Man is an incredibly mediocre game. It had a lot of amazing potential and some great concepts that had it been given more time in the oven to cook, could have been extremely great, but like most things in this game, its lack of polish and extremely poor execution are what bog it down. It's essentially a great foundation, a great starting, a launching pad to a bigger and better sequel, but of course we all know what happened with The Amazing Spider-Man 2, but we're not there yet, so... I get spared another day. Anyways, until the next time guys, I hope to catch you on the next review. We have bleach, right? Like, I need three. I need at least three bottles. I paid for that. I know I'm stupid.